Welcome you for the public talk, Adventure in Biology, Exploring the Amazing World of Frogs, and for introducing Emily. Emily is one of the leader authorities in, on evolutionary biology in amphibians. So it is a great treat, a great treat to have her here and talk to us tonight. She has been interested in ecology, behavior, and genetics of frogs to understand <coughs> their evolutionary history. She, she used the latest uh, molecular methods to develop new conceptual, conceptual frameworks and understand speciation and divergence processes within this group of animals. For these advances, she has received many awards and published more than 70 scientific papers. She has done research in different parts of the US and, and collaborated with uh, researchers in different and around the world. So with that, I'm delighted to introduce Emily Lemon. Okay, thank you Juan Carlos, and thank you all for coming tonight. I really had no idea how exactly to spin the talk tonight, at, at what level to fling it, so I've kind of combined uh, some basic intro information about uh, amphibians in general, and then I'll get in a little bit into uh, sort of the basics of my research program, and then we'll switch to more of um, a few fun videos of interesting things that frogs do and then finish with kind of a travel log of some adventures we've had in Ecuador uh, on some field trips. So hopefully there'll be a little bit of something for everybody. And if one part seems uh, uninteresting to you, just let your eyes glaze over for a few minutes and I'll be switching to something hopefully more interesting shortly thereafter. So thank you. Okay, so uh, yes, I'm talking about uh, some adventures in biology that uh, I've had over the years. I'm uh, currently an associate professor at Florida State University back in the States, and my husband and I are currently on sabbatical. Uh, we're actually based in Canberra over in Australia, but we spent the last month in New Zealand um, trying to see everything, which is impossible, of course, even though it's kind of a smaller country relative to the U.S., but there's so much diversity here and so many different ecosystems to explore and uh, animals to try to see. And so uh, we had been to Australia once before about 10 years ago and we felt like we scratched the surface then. And at this point we feel like we've made two scratches on the surface. So I guess we'll have to come back for another visit. Okay, so I'm going to be talking about amphibians. So I wanted to start with some background on amphibians, just some basic information um, amphibians are composed of three different orders, and most people are familiar with frogs, of course. They're sort of the, the charismatic members of this group. And then uh, most people have heard of salamanders as well, although they don't occur down in this part of the world. Uh, but very few people have actually heard of a third order here called uh, Sicilians. Um, those are the amphibians in the middle. Now, does that look like an amphibian, do you think? No, most people think that's a, like a giant earthworm. And these weird amphibians um, occur in the tropics uh, at the Old World and New World. So they're in like South America and Africa and tropical areas. And they're fossorial, which means they live underground. And basically the only time you can see them is when it floods in those areas and they come up to the surface for air. And sometimes they come up in large numbers, sort of like earthworms do. And at that point, you can capture them and study them. But because they tend to occur in really remote areas uh, and only sporadically after these sorts of natural disasters, uh, they just haven't been very well studied. So anyway, uh, a new thing for you if you haven't heard before is that there's a third order of amphibians, the Sicilians. Um, and just for comparison, really quick, I'm gonna present the, the reptiles. Um, and this is in quotes because uh, classically, reptiles have referred to these little scurrying things with scales that live on the ground. But actually, um, and you probably know this already, reptiles also include the birds evolutionarily. And so uh, one of the groups here is the turtles, uh, and others crocodilians, and then of course your famous tuataris here. You all have a unique order of, uh, of reptiles here in New Zealand. And then the lizards and snakes are in the same uh, same order, and I figured this 
this picture here represented that group really well. We have a snake eating a lizard, so we got both in one photograph here. <laughs> um, but again, uh, reptiles, if you're um, including all of the descendants uh, and a common ancestor of the group, that would uh, this would also comprise, include birds and the reptiles. So some distinguishing characteristics between the two, um, because uh, you know this is particularly something to point out for kids um, who they may see a salamander and a lizard side by side and not be able to tell the difference so well because you know, they both have four legs, they're both uh, low to the ground, they kind of act similarly. But um, the main difference, the easiest thing to remember to distinguish amphibians from reptiles is that amphibians have no scales and reptiles do have scales. And there are all these other characteristics too, but the scales uh, character is uh, usually the easiest um, way to distinguish, for example, a salamander from a lizard. Okay, here are a few other photographs of some uh, Sicilians. These are again uh, found in tropical areas. These are different groups. You can see the head of this one here and some little tiny teeth. Um, and then they even come in really bright colors like this fluorescent orange uh, Sicilian with a bunch of babies right there. And here are a few photographs of salamanders. Uh, this is a tiger salamander, which is native to North America. Um, they actually used the larvae of these guys for fishing bait up where I come from. Um, and here's another uh, species of salamander there. And uh, this, this slide here shows sort of the diversity within the salamanders. Uh, this is the, uh, one of the world's smallest species. This is an adult salamander here on somebody's fingernail. It's very tiny. Whereas this is the world's largest species, the, the Japanese giant salamander. And you can see this is a guy leaning over trying to hold this, this animal up. And they're huge. And uh, these, these are very uh, rare and endangered uh, salamanders um, native to Japan. Um, and here are a couple other groups. This is a, this is a newt, which uh, a lot of times you can find in the pet tree. Okay, moving on to frogs, which is the, the, the point of this talk. Here are a few examples of some of the extreme phenotypic variation within frogs. Um, this species here, this is Ceratophrys, this is often found in the pet trade. Um, people call it the Pac-Man frog because these guys will just sit there not moving for days and then you plop a live pinky mouse in there and it disappears. They have huge mouths and they'll just basically suck it in whole. Um, here's a, a water holding frog. Um, we'll be seeing a video later about these guys. Um, this is an Asian uh, horn frog, and uh, these are one of my favorite groups here. This is uh, one of the Racaforan frogs, and you see this extensive webbing between their toes. They don't use that webbing for swimming like you might think of uh, for most frogs. These are actually tree frogs. You can see their toe pads here that help them uh, climb high up in the trees. And uh, again, these are from Southeast Asia, and what they actually use that webbing for is when they're up in the trees and a predator comes along, say a bird or a, a snake uh, that wants to eat them for lunch, they actually jump out of the trees, spread those toes, and parachute. They parachute and they glide to a, a neighboring tree in order to escape the predator. And uh, I should have pulled up the video of this uh, today, I forgot to. But um, if you're interested, just look up the flying frogs of Southeast Asia and you can get some neat YouTube videos of flying frogs like this. Um, here's one other slide showing some of the, some more of the variation in frogs. This is the world's largest species, a South African bullfrog. Um, and these guys are clearly a great food source for uh, people. Look at those nice big legs that you can fry up in, uh, in grease and uh, eat, eat like chicken. And this is uh, the world's smallest frog right there. That's an adult on somebody's fingertip. And on the left we have um, a toad and a tree frog. Okay, so now I'm going to switch to talking a little bit about my research um, fairly briefly. Uh, I, I don't want to get too much in depth into the specifics of what I do, but uh, I want to make sure you kind of understand the general uh, principles of what we're trying to study. And so I work on the North American horse frog being from Florida. And these are some of the species distributions of different uh, species in this genus of frogs. And uh, some of the associated photographs are shown here. And uh, this is me doing some field work out in Florida. This is a pitcher plant bog. Uh, in our part of Florida, we have these, uh, these wet meadows that are filled with carnivorous plants. 
and they're soggy year round and it's just not, it, it's too acidic for a lot of plants to grow. But uh, one of the species of frogs that I study loves this habitat. And in fact, the acidic water helps suppress fungal growth on their eggs. So their, uh, their egg clutches have higher survival because of the high air, the, the acidic nature of the water. And these are a couple of the habitats in this area. This is a pinewood pond here, and this is a cypress gum swamp. And these two habitats uh, form a mosaic of uh, you know, ecological uh, habitat types uh, in the area that I work in. And in fact, two different species of frogs uh, like these areas. One is called Sudacris nigrida, and the other Sudacris ferriarum. And in areas where there's actually an ecotone between these two habitats, we find hybridization between the two species associated with these habitats. Here's another picture of me uh, looking for frogs in the field. This is basically what I do for fun. Um, we go out at night. This picture is kind of taken at sunset, so there's a little light there. And uh, you know, I wear my headlight, and we're digging through grass, tracking frogs down based on their acoustic signal, because it's really pretty much impossible to locate these frogs if they're not calling. Uh, the frogs I study are about this big, so um, about the size of, I guess here you would call it a gold coin, we would call it a quarter in the US. And uh, they're very cryptic little brown frogs and hard to find again unless they're calling, so that's me trying to pick one out of the grass. And this is my husband Alan here, dressed in his herping gear. Herping is what we call uh, looking for reptiles and amphibians. And so he has a snake hook here because we're working in rattlesnake territory uh, in that shot. And then this is uh, an old experiment we did as graduate students raising tadpoles uh, in, the, in uh, captivity. And uh, these are hybrid crosses between two species because we are uh, trying to study the effect of fitness on, uh, or effect of hybridization on fitness of uh, individuals. Okay, so the main questions I'm interested in involve <coughs> trying to understand how new species form. And you can study this question in all kinds of different groups of organisms, plants, animals, fungi, whatever it is. But I uh, work on addressing this question using frogs as the model system. And one way in which new species can form is when you have two partially diverged uh, taxa species um, or subpopulations that have been separated uh, based on some geographic barrier for a while. And then when they come back into contact, uh, something interesting happens, which I'll show you here. And the, the, this interesting thing is called reinforcement, which is the evolution of prezygotic guidance letting barriers in contact zones as a response to selection against hybridization. So sorry about the lingo, I'll explain what that means now. So say uh, initially a population has some uh, distribution of a trait, maybe a reproductive trait, that looks like this. So on the x-axis here, we have uh, the, the trait variation, and y-axis, the frequency at which that variation um, occurs. And um, let's pretend, uh, this is a highly unrealistic scenario, but let's take Australia for a moment and say this species, um, this purple species, ranges across the eastern uh, third of the continent. And again, this is a highly unrealistic scenario, but say a glacier expands across the middle of Australia and splits that purple species uh, into two groups. And through time, those two groups, the blue and the red there, uh, start to diverge from each other genetically. So they've been separated by a geographic barrier for some, for some time. And mutations arise that lead to differences in the acoustic signal of, say these are frogs here in this case, and also um, mutations arise that lead to genetic incompatibility, so genetic differences between the subpopulations, such that should that glacier finally melt, and the two subpopulations come back into contact with each other, their uh, distributions and with respect to that original trait look something like this. They're now no longer completely overlapping, but they're partially overlapping. So when that happens, the distribution now looks more like this. Okay, so today, uh, now we have these two subpopulations back together, and we have blue animals and we have red animals, uh, trying to breed in the same sites, the same breeding ponds. And let's say a, a female from the red sub subpopulation has some underlying preference for a male with a reproductive trait right here in the middle between the two distributions. Well, if she goes out looking for a mate, she basically has a 50-50 chance of picking a blue male versus a red male in the pond. 
Okay, so just by chance, he picks the blue male. If reproductive incompatibilities have um, indeed evolved between the two groups when they were in isolation, then when they try to mate, um, they're going to have hybrid problems. You've heard about how hybridization can um, do bad things for, for organisms. So say that she, her off, she, she's able to produce a few offspring when she hybridizes with a male from this other subpopulation. Alternatively, say there's another female out in the population that has an underlying preference for male signals way over here on this side of the axis. And uh, so if she's looking for a mate, she's much more likely to pick a male from her own subpopulation and as a consequence, uh, produce many offspring because uh, those genetic incompatibilities are not present between two members of the red subpopulation. And so what happens through time is those two distributions, uh, those trait distributions for the subpopulation start to shift apart because the ones in the middle are not producing very many offspring, if any, and the ones at the extremes are producing offspring. So these distributions are shifting. And this is, uh, this is what happens when reinforcement uh, is driving speciation, the formation of new species. And so we think something like this has happened in uh, this species, uh, this pair of species that I work on um, in North America. So here, um, the dark gray distribution is represented, represents uh, the species I mentioned earlier, Sudacris ferriar, and the light gray distribution represents um, Sudacris nigrida. And the very dark distribution in here indicates areas where they overlap with each other, okay, where they're sympatric is the, is the lingo term for that. And so um, what a, an earlier researcher, Jack Foquette, found is when he recorded male calls along a transect from uh, central Kentucky going all the way down into Alabama and into Florida and then down into central Florida. So, so each of these dotted lines corresponds to a population over here on the map. He found with respect to this one call character that's really easy to measure called pulse rate, he found that where the two species overlap in this area here, uh, fairy arm has diverged in its acoustic signal basically to get away from nigrida and reduce that main in interference. Now, um, I use the, 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 the language get away from, but that's not exactly true because the animals are not consciously saying, I'm going to change my call to get away from this other species. What's happening is that process I mentioned on the previous couple of slides where natural and in this case sexual selection against hybridization is driving uh, the two species apart. And so that's what's going on here. And these uh, graphs here just represent what the, the, the calls of these species look like. This is Nigrida, this is Ferriarum, um, this is the call of Nigrida and Allopatry and Sympatry, this is the call of Ferriarum and Allopatry and Sympatry. So Sympatry again is the area where the two species overlap. So can you see the shift just visually between this call and this call? Okay, well, I'll, I'll be playing these some calls here in a minute so you can hear the differences for yourself. Okay, so um, some of the work that I did was to really try to study geographic variation in these patterns. And so I ran transects recording calls um, between areas where only fairy arm occurred, areas where both species co-occurred, and areas where just nigrida occurred um, across the contact zone between these species in order to determine whether the similar patterns of call divergence occurred throughout this contact zone. So let me play for you what the calls sound like first. This is the fairy arm call. Okay, and now I'm gonna play for you the Nigrida call and uh, just nod if you think it sounds different. So, something that is probably already obvious to you, but typically different species that occur in the same areas have very different sounding calls. But sometimes, like in this case, two species with somewhat similar calls end up trying to breed in the same areas, and that's when these, this evolutionary divergence uh, can happen. So that, that, that's what we're seeing here. This is a third species that the other two taxa interact with in some areas. This is Sudacus brimlei, so again, just nod if you think it sounds different. Okay, great. 
Great, yes, so all three of these species, they vary from each other mostly with respect to pulse rate, which is that variable I mentioned on the previous slide. The pulse rate is just how fast the little ticks within the call are produced. Okay, so uh, you, you, can, you can hear the differences uh, acoustically among species based on what I just played, but what I've been studying for the last uh, several years is um, how acoustic differences evolve within species as an indirect effect of this process of reinforcement. So uh, what I've been studying is how interactions between species, like in the case of the interaction between Nigrida and Ferriar, can indirectly lead to a divergence across populations of the same species. Um, and so what you can see here, again, these graphs here correspond to my uh, transects on this previous page. So this here is the Georgia transect, uh, which is represented by these dots here. and. Um, this is as technical as it's going to get, so it'll, it'll get more simple here in a minute, but I, I just want to try to walk you through it um, in case you uh, aren't really interested in the story. This is what the call of fairy arm looks like when it doesn't occur with any other species. It falls out right in the middle of this graph with respect to pulse rate and pulse number, which are two uh, call characters that we can quantify easily. Um, the gray dots here indicate what the call of this same species sounds like when it occurs uh, with the other species, Sudicris nigrida. So this pattern here, the shift in the acoustic signal, is not, uh, it's not a plastic change. It's not something that they can just con consciously change. This is an evolutionary response to selection against this call in areas where they interact with nigrida. This is the call of nigrida down here. So, these guys have evolved this direction, and as a consequence, their call is less similar to Nigrida now. So this is what the call looks like when fairy arm co-occurs with Nigrida. And this is what the call looks like when fairy arm occurs by itself. Okay, does that make sense so far? All right, so now I'm just gonna show you what the, the, the different transects look like in terms of the outcome of their patterns. So in Georgia, fairy arm has this place only in pulse rate, in Florida, they've displaced in both pulse rate and pulse number. And in uh, South Carolina, uh, fairy arm has only displaced in pulse number. What we think is going on here is uh, that third species I mentioned, Brimlei, is represented here by the stars. And when fairy arm occurs with both of these other species, Nigrida here and Brimlei here, they're basically sandwiched along the x-axis between those two species. And so they're being forced to evolve in a new direction, which is up in the case of, in this case, up in, in increase in pulse number to get away from uh, these other two species. So uh, the, this is what the, the calls of these different populations of the same species sound like as a consequence of um, the indirects of reinforcement. So let me just play the allopatric call. So this is the call of fairy arm where it occurs alone. Okay, this is the call of fairy arm where it's sympatric with uh, Nigrida in Georgia. Can you hear the difference? Okay, again, here's the allopatric call again. Okay, here's what the, the, the call sounds like in sympatry in Florida. So that's a little bit more subtle of a difference, but it's still a significant difference between the allopatric call. Okay, and one more time, this is the call in isolation in allopatry. Okay, and then this is the call of fairy arm where uh, it overlaps with both of these other species and it's increased in pulse number. Can you hear that call just keeps going and going and going? So a large number of pulses in that population. And so, what we see here is that diversification among these different populations is on par with differences among species that you see in other frog systems. Um, and so an obvious question here, and one that I've been addressing with my work for the last few years is, are these populations now uh, becoming reproductively isolated from each other, given these substantial differences? So like, are these two populations isolated? 
and are they isolated from this one? Do they even recognize each other as the same species anymore? Or have these differences become so great that they, uh, they're speaking different languages, basically? And so uh, for, for part of my research programs, one of the things we've been doing over the last few years is a series of female choice tests. And um, these are really interesting, because what we can do is catch a female frog and give her a choice between two or more different male calls. Um, and we can play those calls back and forth for, uh, to her. You can see this is our primitive graduate school setup uh, back before I had uh, research funds as a faculty member to do things in a more professional way. But this is what we did in grad school, is we had uh, two speakers, and we would play uh, a call of fairy arm from one speaker and a call of nigrita from the other speaker, and put a female in the middle, do this in a completely darkened room, no sound, no noise. We have an infrared camera on the frog so we could watch their behavior, and we would sit in a neighboring room and monitor their behavior and do this all night long uh, for multiple nights in a row. And later, once we had funds, I actually built this portable behavioral uh, laboratory. This is my 20-foot cargo trailer, which we, uh, <clears throat> we bought two 2,000-pound practice rooms, acoustic practice rooms that are acoustically insulated, and built them into this chamber so that the whole trailer, when it's fully loaded, weighs 8,000 pounds. I, I don't know what that would be in kilograms exactly, but anyway, it's heavy. In fact, it was so heavy that uh, it ended up being too much for our departmental vehicles to haul. So I ended up needing, I, I, had to buy a, I had to buy my own vehicle to pull our portable lab around the country. Um, because in, in, in these frogs, uh, they only respond in the, pre in the preference test if you test them the night of capture. And so you can't just like catch them and then ship them in the mail or drive them for several days back to the, the main lab. You have to take the lab to the frogs. So anyway, this is our portable preference chamber. And um, this is the biggest truck that Chevrolet sells that I, I bought to haul the 8,000 pound trailer. And this is the inside of one of the acoustic uh, practice rooms here. There's a kiddie pool on the inside um, with one speaker there. And you can see this is our setup. We have two rooms in this 20 foot trailer and there's a little bit of space between them. And we watch on the cameras in infrared what exactly the frog behaviors um, uh, what exactly the frogs are doing within the chambers. And we're playing different calls, different stimuli to the animals and uh, watching their behavior all night and recording that information. So that's what this looks like. Um, and I'm going to show you a, a preference test here in just a second. But um, in a nutshell, this again, this is just a summary of several years of work. But what we found is that uh, we have new species uh, in the process of forming here in this system. Because what's happened is these, these red circles indicate um, the phenotypes of males from different populations. These are the acoustic signals of males from different populations. So we already knew those were different based on the other figures I showed you. Um, but what we found from all these choice tests where we give females a choice between this stimulus and this stimulus and between this stimulus and this one, and we test all these different populations of females, what we found is that um, females do not recognize acoustic signals of males of their own species from one of these other populations, from, from one or more of these other populations. So that indicates that these populations are gradually diverging from each other. And um, one of the reasons I really like working on the system is because we know the mechanism that's driving this divergence. We have um, reinforcement between species and um, interactions in different types of communities, whether they're two species communities or three species communities, that are driving the populations to evolve in uh, different directions, resulting in this differentiation. Okay, so now I'm just going to show you what one of those preference test looks like, and then I'll show you some videos here, just trying to get out of here, and then um, from here on it will be much less technical. Okay, so here is a sped up video of a choice test in these frogs. So the female will be starting out here in the middle, and again this is, uh, we recorded, we filmed the females in complete darkness, so they're only using uh, acoustic information to locate their mates. And so they're listening to these speakers playing back and forth. You won't hear any sound here. And they swim to the speaker that they think represents the male they want to mate with. Okay, so there are two tests here. Uh, 
kind of concatenated back to back. So here's the first one. And watch for the little tiny frog up here somewhere. There she goes. Did you see that? Okay, she's, um, there she is. Okay, she just made a choice.